Hello and welcome, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so the topic of this talk originally started with a long, winded title, where it was something about leveraging WASM to improve quality. And then as I was building out the presentation, it became clear that we were actually supercharging our APIs and decided to go with the punchier title. So you can take your pick for whichever title you want for this session. Um, so my name is Rohan Deshpande. Um, I'm a managing director and a senior engineer at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I've been at Goldman for three years. And some of the areas that me and my teams, we run um, are around platforms. So we own and operate a mobile platform that's used by um, multiple mobile applications at Goldman Sachs. Um, our focus is really on developer productivity. Um, so anything to do with improving engineering efficiency, being able to write code faster, being able to reduce your build cycles, those are all part of the uh, the charter of my teams. And along with that, we're also playing around with generative AI, like I think everyone else is, and um, I think it's a very promising technology. Um, and we also want to operate an API platform for Goldman Sachs. And that is going to be, I think, the, the focus of this talk and the, the crux of the discussion here. So the Goldman Sachs' API platform um, has been around for quite a few years, actually. And um, it's, it's actually the foundation of um, Goldman being an API-first organization. So anytime someone's building a service at the firm, they think in terms of what would it look like if you put an API in front of it and they start with an API construct. Um, and generally, we offer these services either externally, either internally. Um, if they're available externally, they're available through our developer portal at developer.gs.com. So, if you wanted to leverage functionality like doing money transfers or um, doing um, uh, get, getting various data feeds that are uh, financial related, um, you can take advantage of our uh, external offerings, external services, integrate with them, and um, you can build your own application on top of it. So my team provides the infrastructure that powers um, these API-based services at Goldman Sachs. Um, and we serve millions of requests per day. So it's, it's pretty significant in scale. And um, just in terms of reliability and requirements for each of these APIs, they have different requirements. So it's, it, it's a multi-tenant, fairly complex piece of infrastructure. Um, API Platform has been around for you know, quite a few years. So we have the dreaded legacy that we have to support. So we support multiple runtimes as part of this, this gateway infrastructure. Um, and if you look at a runtime, typically, you know, when an API request comes in, it's, it's a fairly, if you just step all the way back to the 10,000 foot level, it's a fairly sequential flow. Um, you have a request coming in, it'll go through a series of steps, you can call them plugins or filters or whatever it might be, that's the logic that you would use to perform some action on that request goes to your actual business logic, does some work over there, sends back a response, and will follow a similar path back out to, to your caller. Um, so these steps, filters, plugins, um, we actually have three different categories of plugins that we have to support here. Uh, the first one are what the vendors provide. So you know, if you're running the Envoys or the NGINXs, you get a bunch of plugins out of the box, which you can use to extend those engines. Um, generally, the vendor or the, or the project itself will provide a bunch of them. Um, you know, they, they all do all the testing. You can validate them as you need to, but generally they come back as a, a package in a box. They could be implemented using C++ or a scripting language like Lua or something similar. Um, I think the more interesting is the custom plugins that we own and operate. So we have two categories there too. Um, there's a bunch of plugins that might teams build and operate on behalf of the firm. This could be something that's shared functionality that's used for, that's applicable to everyone. For example, let's say you wanna um, have open ID or you might wanna do some kind of metering on, on your APIs. That would be a common plugin that my team would own and operate and provide. Um, but then we also have plugins that are customer teams, uh, our internal teams that use our platform, we call them customers, and so they would build their own plugins as well, um, primarily because they might have functionality that's unique to just their use case, um, and they might want to implement something, and it doesn't make sense to make it into a whole firm-wide offering, so it becomes something that the team would own and operate, and then they would plug into um, this multi-tenant system that we have. Um, or 
the other option is they might choose, they might not want to build it, but they'll come to my team and be like, hey, we need you to build this plugin for us. And then we'll go back to me like, you know what, we're so backlogged, it's going to be 18 months before we can take a look at a request. And that doesn't scale because everything needs to be done at the speed of business, aka yesterday. So in that case, what we would love to do is enable each of these teams to build this functionality themselves um, and provide it as a plugin that we can then run within this uh, shared infrastructure. So the challenge with building these plugins, especially as they're running in this environment, um, first one is the choice of language, right? Typically, like I said, these runtimes either support like C++ or, um, uh, or a scripting language like Lua, but that's not really the most common skill set. Like, you know, generally developers, um, they're more familiar with higher level languages like Go or Java or you know, JavaScript, TypeScript. Um, and they would prefer to write these plugins using, they would prefer to write code using any one of these languages. Um, we have a fairly mature um, SDLC, a soft development lifecycle, so we want to be able to take advantage of our investments in CI CD um, in best practices like code reviews and IP scans and dependency management. These are things that are getting more and more important as, you, as, you, um, as, as secure SDLCs become a thing. Um, and so, Ideally, you want to go with these mainstream languages because they have support. Um, they're used by thousands of engineers at the firm, and they have support from a tooling perspective across the board as well. Um, running in a multi-tenant environment, you want security. You want some kind of isolation, both from a runtime perspective as well as from an operational perspective because I, you don't want one plugin causing issues to every other plugin running in that flow. Um, and then from a compilation and build system perspective, you want to leverage everything that we already have. Um, and finally, one you know, a bonus would be if you could reuse code because we have multiple engines. Instead of writing the same business logic multiple times that is specific to the engine, ideally we could write it once as a library and then integrate it into each of these plugins. So we had a bunch of requirements. Um, we went around looking for was there something that could help us solve these use cases, and very quickly we came across WebAssembly. Um, I think primarily it started because uh, Envoy was supporting WebAssembly, um, and so we started looking at it. We looked at some of the technologies. We decided that WebAssembly seemed the most promising of all the options out there. One is, you know, the binary format gives the efficient execution semantics. Um, it runs in the sandbox. Um, it's portable, so whether you're running on different flavors of Linux, you're still using the same uh, the same uh, the same uh, WebAssembly module. Um, you can use multiple languages that can target uh, uh, target compilation to WebAssembly. Um, and then it's a very extensible uh, system as well. So a lot of these, there's, there's quite a few other benefits, but these were the ones that stood out to us as, hey, you know what, let's take a look at WebAssembly. And so when we were like, hey, let's take a look at WebAssembly, um, how do we know it actually works, right? Because there's a bunch of material out there. WebAssembly, the ecosystem is moving pretty quickly. Um, is this something that we could actually leverage and um, end, up, and end up with a fairly safe but also reliable plug-in model for the, for the API gateway system that we have? So we decided to do a proof of concept. Um, we had an existing plugin that was doing account number redaction. Account numbers are fairly standard, well-defined uh, structures. It's a nine-character format, nine-character string format. And so we decided to do a little bit of an A-B test and also try and do a proof of concept where we could build a plugin using WebAssembly, plug it into our runtimes and see how it worked um, from a redaction perspective. So the requirements were pretty straightforward. Um, identify the nine character account number coming back in the response and then redact the first five characters with asterisks. So just give back the last four. Um, and then we wanted to try a few more things. We were like, hey, let's try and implement this using Go. As, as the language, and can we try and get to at least 70% test coverage? Because the test coverage was, I think, abysmal is giving it too much credit uh, for these plugins, We're probably in the 10, 15% range. And of course, that never really covered like all the use cases you would like to, so we were trying to get to like a much higher number here. Um, and they wanted to take advantage of all the build and deploy tooling that we had and all the investments we're making from a SDLC and CSED perspective. Um, as a bonus, we wanted to try if we could share this code across multiple runtimes, um, the, uh, multiple engines, but then really we were trying to see if we could share the code between Envoy and Nginx, um, and how much of that code could we share. So to get started, 
Um, if you build a plugin, where does it fit in that typical API architecture? Um, you can see the reduction plugin would sit um, on the response side, be a fairly simple plugin. It takes in some input and sends you back and continues the JSON response back with a redacted account number. So in order to build this, you know, the development workflow would basically be, hey, let's write some code, let's compile it to, into a WebAssembly module, and then let's integrate it into each of these runtimes. Um, from a code perspective, the code is actually fairly straightforward Go. I'm not sure if you can see it, um, but there's, there's a masking function here. It takes a string input, blah, blah, blah. Nothing, nothing magic over there. And then there's a, there's a response handler for the, um, for the request, for the, for the response itself. Um, you can see we're use, actually using ProxyWasm, uh, the ProxyWasm Go SDK, in order to interface with, uh, with the proxy itself for, to you know, grab the request and then uh, manipulate it and then uh, swap the response on the stream. Um, but again, if you look at the code, like there's nothing unusual about it. It just looks just like any other Go code you would typically write. Um, which is very different than if you were using, um, uh, you know, a, a scripting language or something in order to implement these plugins. And then, the benefit, the nice, the nice thing that we got along with it was the ability to write unit tests again using these high-level languages. So for Go, for example, uh, we were able to write fairly comprehensive unit tests, and in fact, we got to about 80 plus percent test coverage just out of the box, writing a whole bunch of not just positive tests, but also a bunch of negative tests here to ensure that um, the plugin was working as expected, and we were handling a bunch of edge cases here. So once we had these unit tests, we had the code in the unit tests, um, next up was let's compile this to WebAssembly, right? And so um, the question was, how do we do it? Like, you can use a bunch of standard compilers, but the one we ended up going with uh, was using TinyGo. Um, so TinyGo is a compiler which has uh, WebAssembly as a target, um, and it creates small efficient modules. It's actually intended for embedded systems, but we were able to leverage it and use it to, um, uh, to build these plugins that we could then run on, on the server itself as part of our API pipeline. Um, if, again, the, the command itself, it took a little bit of figuring things out, but again, this, it's all documented, so there wasn't much there. Um, there were a couple of uh, situations we ran into for some of the other plugins as we, as we were moving forward around um, uh, around like garbage collection specifically. So there might be a few other parameters you might need to tweak depending on the uh, capability of building here. But otherwise, again, it's it's pretty straightforward. Like take take tiny Go for example, and you can take your Go code and turn it into a WebAssembly module. Once we had the module, next step was how do we integrate it into the runtimes. This is actually, I think, the most difficult part because um, you know, once you have a WebAssembly module, trying to integrate it into um, an existing web engine like Envoy or Nginx, it's there is documentation, but you know, the documentation and the systems are moving so fast that it did take a little bit of research here. Um, but ultimately, it came down to an integration file, right? It, you know, it's very, very simply put, it's it's a configuration that you figure out you deploy as part of your package along with the WebAssembly module, and then boom, you're, good, you're ready to go. You have your plugins. Um, so once we had that, then we were able to leverage a CI-CD pipeline as well. Um, a pipeline has, amongst the many other steps, I think these are the most important ones that we were able to take advantage of. We could do dependency scanning on the plugin itself to ensure we were using um, the correct dependencies, nothing that had a CVE or something associated with it. We were able to run our unit test and then ensure that we had code coverage. So we set a threshold of uh, 78%, um, which was greater than zero, which we had, pre which was the previous threshold. So we were able to get uh, proper code coverage here and actually treat this as a proper software artifact. Um, we run IP scans as part of all our um, uh, all our code that gets checked in and built, um, and then. The script you saw basically formed the, the core of this compilation step where it, it took the Go code, um, compiled it into a WebAssembly module, and then the follow-up to that is we build it into an image, image gets uploaded to our uh, container repository, and then consumers can pull from the container repository and then deploy these runtimes as they want to. Um, so again, the, the point is what we ended up with was taking advantage of all our investments in our CI-CD and our SDLC uh, by using a high-level language here. 
Um, one little issue we ran into, the compilation step, turned out it was much slower than just standard Go code. Um, we haven't figured that out yet, but then what we ended up doing was just sharding the compilation step. So for like, you know, every five plugins, we would do the build process on a separate, uh, separate host as part of the compilation step, just parallelizing it. So we ended up with uh, getting similar total end-to-end -to -end times on our pipeline here. So as part of this process, you know, building this one-off plugin as a proof of concept, lessons we learned. Um, yes, we are able to develop using a familiar, well-supported language like Go, which has proper support within our ecosystem as well as outside. Um, with this language, we were able to take advantage of all of our tooling. Um, you know, anything about code scanning, package management, dependency management, um, containers, whatever we had, we were just able to plug right into it um, and build out a proper, um, uh, a proper gateway solution that had uh, the right plugins baked in, uh, which, which were built with custom code. Um, we actually achieved 83% code coverage, and again, this is straightforward. We can, we can probably go higher here, but at, at this point, um, I think about 83% we started seeing diminishing returns. Um, but generally, again, this is, you know, this is no different than any kind of Go code, right? So you could take advantage of it and go as high as you wanted to over here. Um, one nice benefit was just, again, out of the box, we were able to share about 35% of the code we wrote between the various runtimes that we had. And this is, again, with zero effort, um, with minimal design changes, just taking the core logic, that masking function logic itself, along with some other decoration around it for error handling and whatnot, that just became the core of the, the plugin itself and we were able to use this across the board. I'm pretty sure we can actually get to higher than 50% with, uh, with, uh, with a little more investment in like structuring the code itself, um, but that's a, that's a challenge for another day. Um, the downside, so there are lots of positives. The downside is there was some performance impact. Um, what we saw was about a 14% give or take reduction in uh, throughput per host. Um, with, with, this, with this gateway. Again, we were expecting some reduction in throughput, just given how the, the WebAssembly, the runtime itself operates within these, within these engines. 14% um, was actually well within the bounds of what we were expecting. Um, so again, this was, this was just out of the box with basically no performance tuning, no, um, no tweaking, anything at all. Um, and you know, we'll, as we, um, because we, had, we do handle hundreds of, million requests, hundreds of millions of requests a day. Um, it is in our interest to try and reduce that hit as, as much as possible. So we'll keep investing in the performance side of things and try and reduce that, uh, um, uh, try and reduce that hit to like single digits at least if we can. So what we'll be able to prove here is like, hey, you can write a plugin and you can actually use WebAssembly and it works almost as well as a plugin written with C++ or Lua that's running within one of these runtimes. And so lots of, lots of very positive benefits here. So outcomes, right? So um, we do have a ton of plugins that, that either first party we've implemented them or different teams have implemented them. So because of the experiments we ran, um, by the way, that was a whole, that, that was about a nine month process from start to finish to get to the point where we were like, hey, this evaluation works, like this is great, we should actually proceed with it. So we had a decision to proceed. We've been converting um, our plugins into this uh, WebAssembly-based model, um, leveraging Go uh, as, the, as a language of choice for implementation. So we've converted 55% of our plugins so far. Um, we will be converting them as we, um, oh, through the rest of the year. Our first plugin that's based on WebAssembly is actually going into production in Q4. So we're obviously being cautious and careful um, because it's new technology to run in production. Um, but we're looking to do like a, a blue-green rollout or a little bit of a, like an AB rollout where we do, um, uh, we'll have like uh, requests going through different pipelines and then we can have traffic going through one versus the other. We can do a comparison and as we start scaling up traffic going through the WebAssembly based uh, system. So we're actually looking forward. I think we'll, we'll see a lot of benefits overall. Now, if you're planning to do this, if you're planning to go the WebAssembly route here, um, a few things to keep in mind. The biggest debate we had was around trading runtime performance versus development convenience. So as a developer, yes, you can write using Go or whatever language you might choose, but downside is, are you willing to accept that performance hit? 
And I think that's that's the biggest debate and the and the trade-off you need to go into. You need to make that decision very consciously. Um, if you're trying to reuse code across different runtimes, it, it's actually fairly essential to carefully design that core of your plugin versus the wrapper code, the shim code that you need to write in order to integrate with uh, any of these runtimes. Um, as, as we've been converting these plugins, we've been learning more and more lessons about the right design, you know, whatever design principles we might need to follow, what goes inside the body, what stays out. Um, keeping the context clear and then converting the context into something that's a, that's a reusable entity, those are some of the patterns that we're learning and figuring out. And as we, as we learn more, we'll probably start publishing them on, on, a, on a developer blog as well. Um, one of the learning, definitely invest in integration tests. Unit tests are great. Integration tests are even better because you can actually test the end-to-end -end functionality. Um, and that will help you figure out edge cases, especially the integration cases with the runtimes. And there will be quite a few of them because um, you know things like memory usage or um, any kind of ABI incompatibilities that you might run into. Those are things you might discover at runtime, not at, uh, not at build time. So it's actually essential to write a good suite of integration tests and run them consistently. And then the last thing is the ecosystem is very active. You know, WebAssembly, the spec is still evolving. The implementations are evolving. Um, the tools are evolving. And so it's a very active ecosystem, and it's really important to stay on top of all these changes. Um, something that works today may not work two weeks from now. And so staying on top of things, having, you know, taking advantage of CI, CD, and continuous builds and uh, the tooling around it actually becomes super, super essential. And so, um, uh, you know, I guess automation is the key here. Okay, so that I will wrap up. I think we've been at the, we've had a very fun journey. We've been at it since the start of the year. Um, seeing a lot of benefits and we're looking forward to rolling out WebAssembly in production. And uh, feel free to take, check out the developer site, the GS developer site, check out our blog. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions if there's anything. Yeah, so just repeat your questions. The question is how are we doing telemetry from within the plugins overall? Yeah, so we have, um, so depending on the environment we run in, like we do track things like, um, you know, 400s, 500s, um, latencies, those are the three key metrics we'll, we'll track. And so the things we, uh, what we wanted to measure, especially with plugins, especially more into WebAssembly, was the, you know, it's called the dwell time within the plugin itself, right? If a request is coming through your pipeline, um, how much time is it spending inside the plugin itself? And how much time is it spending from just about, I guess, the interface from the, from the runtime itself into the plugin? So we wanted to get both those metrics. So we are capturing both those latencies, or those dwell times, I guess, to get a sense for um, how much faster or slower is it compared to what a native plugin might look like. So we have those metrics. We have we have existing um, tools that we use to like publish these metrics to you know the, the standard ones you can you can assume right. So um, these all end up in the same metric stream, and then they we have dashboards for it. Question. Yeah, so the question is how, like, what does the deployment infrastructure look, right? right? We, we are pretty big about containers, like it's, it's a Kubernetes implementation. So as part of the build process, what we do is we end up with a container, um, and then we deploy that container to whichever Kubernetes uh, uh, controller that we want to deploy it to. So um, that, that's, that's really what it is, right? So uh, the, the complexity here is because we're rolling out a new tech, we don't want to do an all or nothing kind of deployment. So we're doing a variation of blue-green over here where you know, we have the old stuff running, we have uh, new stuff running, we have a load balancer routing some proportion of requests to either you know, fleet A or fleet B. Um, and then we keep an eye on metrics, we have alarms and whatnot going on it. 
So fairly, fairly standard deployment methodology, I would guess. Um, and then we keep, you know, as we keep an eye on uh, traffic, if uh, things are working as well as we expect over a period of time, then we'll start ramping up traffic. Yeah, so why do we see performance degradation? Um, the WebAssembly runtime is actually an out of process call. So what's happening is a request is in your runtime, but then it, it's, it's, making a, it's making an out of process call to the runtime. Now, of course, it's a, it's a cold start problem pretty much the first time, right? So, it, it, so given a large number of requests and over time it will average out, but um, if you don't have sufficient traffic, you will see the cold start fairly frequently. Again, it's, it's an optimization we have to make. We just haven't got to it yet. Um, I'm, again, I'm fairly certain. Like we're, we're, the assumption we made initially was we would see about a 25% hit, so we're ready to take that hit. Um, actually, pleasantly surprised to see was in the, the tens. Um, I think we can get it to single digits. I think with 5%-ish, 5 to 8% percent will be pretty happy in that range. Yeah, because it, it was all running in process, right? Lua runs in process. It was, it was pretty straight. Or C++ runs in process. Oh, yeah. We're just building it as a monolith. Yep. Do you all custom the proxies we have, sorry, the question, what, what are the proxies? Um, so we have some of our stuff running with a variation of Nginx. Um, some of it is Apache. Some of it is uh, Envoy. You, you probably name it, it's there. So <laughs> benefit, of, benefit of running a system that's been in production for decades, I would guess. So. Not all of them. So we only picked a couple of them that are capable of doing it. Any more questions? Oh, all right. Thank you for coming this afternoon. It was good seeing everyone. And uh, go WebAssembly, I guess. <laughs>